Welcome back to the sixth episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex. Today, we're going to be flipping through some of today's top news stories, including a Democratic election denier claims denying elections is one of the hallmarks of fascism, an article about the future of TikTok in America, and the last one, why Massachusetts governorship is likely to flip in 2022. And of course, we'll finish today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now that's enough rambling for me. Let's get into the stories. Our first one comes from the Daily Wire. Democratic election denier claims denying elections is a hallmark of fascism. Congressman Jamie Riskman defended Joe Biden's recent remarks on during Sunday's appearance on MSNBC's Face the Nation, claiming the failure to accept the results of a free and fair election was one of the, quote, hallmarks of a fascist party. Biden took some heat earlier in the week for asserting that some Republicans had embraced, quote, semi-fascism and so-called, quote, MAGA Republicans were a threat to American democracy as critics argue that the president who ran on uniting the country was only dividing the American people further, risking double down on Biden's comments. So before we keep going, just notice the the language here from Joe Biden. I don't know if anybody else watched his speech. Um, the framing was very interesting, to say the least, from a um, standpoint of, why do you have the president lit by red and a black background? Normally those colors are not necessarily associated with the most friendly of presidents. I think that was a very interesting PR move on their part. But they went with it. It created some good memes. But use the use of the term semi-fascism. What does that even mean? What does that, what does that even mean? Inherently... Semi is half. Fascism is a terrible belief system that arose in Europe early in the 20th century. So, great. We, we know what both components of the word are supposed to mean, but what does he mean by it? I need more context here. It, it's kind of just a term that you throw out to rally people behind you, to sound like you're trying to say something important, but it really holds no weight and carries no meaning. So when President Biden said that, I was just left kind of confused by what he meant by it. Not in general. I understand the premise. I understand what he's trying to say, but it just feels like another buzzword. It feels like uh, politics as usual. We're playing at our base, and we're using words and phrases that don't necessarily hold much weight when it comes to their actual meaning, but can rally up the troops. So let's continue with the article here. Raskin, responding to former President Donald Trump's repeated claims that the 2022 election was fraudulent, argued first that every case uh, Trump's attorneys had put forward had failed. Quote, two of the hallmarks of a fascist political party are, one, they don't accept the results of an election that don't go their way, and two, they embrace political violence. And I think that's why President Biden was right to sound the alarm this week, end quote, he added. But Raskin hasn't always been so accepting of election results himself. In January of 2017, when it came time for Congress to certify the results of the 2016 election, Raskin was among those who argued that the votes cast by electors from the state of Florida should not stand. Then Vice President Joe Biden struck down the move, saying, quote, please come to order. The objection cannot be received, end quote. Raskin dismissed criticism of his objection by saying that in 2017, no one had stormed the Capitol, which is true. I'm not saying he's justified in being a hypocrite, and obviously he's just coming down on party lines. We just need to point out that you are saying the exact opposite of what you've done in the past. Your actions do not line up with your words in this case. 
But also, if you were a Democratic politician who didn't like the results of an election, would you not say something and try to not certify those votes, whether it's right or not? Think about yourself in that situation. All right, back to the article. Raskin also objected to the 20, sorry, the 2000 presidential election, stating in a video unearthed by the Republican National Committee that former President George W. Bush had effectively been appointed by the Supreme Court rather than elected by the American people. And Raskin was not the only one. Former Secretary of State and failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton claimed that in 2016, the election was, quote, stolen from her. Joe Biden, sorry, President Joe Biden, after an audience member at a rally referred to Trump as a, quote, illegitimate president, jokingly asked the person to be his vice presidential candidate. I did find that remark kind of funny at the time. Not necessarily appropriate, but but funny. And you, you need a, a president, a POTUS, who's going to have a little bit of a sense of humor. So in context with this article, I actually pulled up some data that was put out by um, the MIT, let's go back here, put out by the M MIT Election Laboratory. So what we have here in figure two, it will be linked with the articles in the description below. Uh, confidence that vote was counted as intended. And this shows the percentage of each party that believed the count was counted as intended. So in 2000, it's high for Republicans. 2004, high for Republicans. 2008, it's a little above 50%. 2012, it goes all the way down to 40%. goes back up in 2016 and back down in 2020. And if we look at Democrats, it's low in both 2000 and 2004, really high in 2008, even higher in 2012, low in 2016, and then high again in 2020. So this data, though very, very basic, gives a brief outline of people's opinions or, or confidence in the electoral system after the election. And as I described... When their party wins, they are more confident in the results of the election, which seems to track. If your candidate loses, are you going to sit there and say, oh, good game, good game? Or if you're thinking, okay, actually, better analogy, think back to Deflategate a few years ago. Whether or not Deflategate was 100% legitimate, if you're on the side of the New England Patriots, you are less likely, you are less inclined to believe that Tom Brady and the team did something wrong during Deflategate because they're your team. You don't want them to lose. You don't want them to be accused of something. At the end of the day, you're going to support them. That's what politics has become for a lot of people. A lot of people who don't care about uh, the policies of the entire party. They're more one policy issue voters or even party loyalists who just vote for one party. So they have the perspective that, oh, my party lost this election. Something may have been going on there. Something may be a little bit fishy. So I always think it's interesting when this conversation comes up. Of course, there are deniers on both sides when their party loses the election. And I do think, of course, we need to point it out, especially when they're in a place of office, because they need to be held to the same standards. And if they're accusing people of being semi-fascist, like Raskin is, then it needs to be brought up that he as well deny the election. So that same process of calling him a semi-fascist could be applied. But let's be honest, if your team loses, you're not going to be happy with it. So, of course, these things happen. All right, let's move on to another story from Wired. It's time to get real about TikTok's risks. Amid a flurry of talking points and takedowns as the United States midterms election loom, lawmakers and regulators have reheated claims about TikTok, a social media app they say poses a threat to personal security and U.S. national security. 
Now the Biden administration is reportedly readying its own action. But the exact scope of the problem and goals remain fuzzy. Owned by the Chinese tech giant ByteDance, TikTok has more than a billion users, including an estimated 1.3 million in the United States. And some lawmakers, including former President Donald Trump, have warned over the past two years that the Chinese government could use the app to collect data on Americans or launch influence operations through the platform. The U.S. military banned its members from using TikTok on the government devices or at all in 2019 and early 2020, as did the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, and some other federal agencies. Just last month, the chief administrative officer for the House of Representatives warned lawmakers against installing TikToks, TikTok due to the data it will collect. This followed the June 17 BuzzFeed News report, which found that ByteDance employees can and do gain access to U.S. TikTok users' data in some situations. But for the general public, warnings from legislators and regulators this summer have continued to be vague and amphimorphous underscoring broader ambiguity about where lawmakers' precise concerns lie. So this is, of course, been an issue. Trump tried to outright ban them through executive order two years ago, I believe. And the, this article is going to take the approach that collecting the data, that bite dance collecting the data, from U.S. users, and since ByteDance is a Chinese company, they a national Chinese company, they are required, if the CCP asks for any sort of data, to turn that over to them. That's how the laws work. The CCP has a stranglehold on almost all businesses. They're not really private businesses. They're state private businesses in China. So the article is going to take the approach that data collection and having an insight into the American populace is the big problem here. I want you to keep in the back of your mind that, that that's a concern, of course. We don't want to give our data over to another country. But when they bring up the influence it can have about misinformation and disinformation, I want you to keep that in the forefront of your mind because I think that's the scarier part. What they never really bring up is the population, the statistics of the population that use TikTok in the United States. If you were to break it down, I'd be willing to bet, and I know for a fact that it's more than 50%, but I'd be willing to bet about 80% of the population using TikTok is 35 or younger. Now, that is extremely scary. The amount of weight that that population has on the political future of this country and the algorithms that show them content and help them form opinions can be shifted by a Chinese company, that's scary. And that's the thing that I think we need to focus on or at least need to address more rather than just data collection. Because we're giving over our data all the time. We give our data to Meta, sorry, Facebook Meta, to Google, to basically any website we use all the time. And I'm pretty sure most Americans are totally okay with that. And even if we don't give it over voluntarily, there are data brokers that China, if they really wanted to, could pay to get our data. Now, should we make it convenient for them by giving them straight access to the data without having to pay by using their app? No. But at the end of the day, it's less about data about us and how they can influence us. Now, back to the article. With so many users, TikTok is clearly a potential rich source of personal data and could be exploited in the way other social media platforms have spread disinformation or promote influential operations. But the reason TikTok has been signaled out as less clear is less clear. Huge quantities of sensitive data about people living in the U.S. are already available for various forms of purchase and taking through other public social media platforms, the digital marketing industry, data brokers, and leaked stolen data troves. And long before the rise of TikTok, China was already notorious on the global stage for stealing massive quantities of data about Americans and other governments and companies around the world. So is this protectionism, xenophobia, special insight into U.S. national security? A report published by CIFOR, 
uh, on Friday indicates that the Biden administration is preparing a series of executive orders to address TikTok and the Chinese tech sector's access to Americans' data more broadly. The report says the White House's actions could significantly curtail investment in China, while other potential measures may limit that what technology could be sold to Chinese clients and specifically limit the data Chinese tech companies can collect from U.S. citizens. Such steps would be less dramatic than the approach to TikTok taken by Biden's predecessor, but would have a longer scope and a wider set of potential ramifications. In the waning months of Trump's administration, the White House attempted to block TikTok from U.S. app stores if ByteDance didn't sell the company to U.S.-based firms. Though the move failed, TikTok took steps to silo itself from its Chinese owners and announced in June that all U.S. user traffic would be routed in the U.S., the company is still working on deleting all user data from its own servers in favor of processing everything on Oracle's cloud. The company stores data backups in the U.S. and Singapore. Quote, the one thing about TikTok is that a lot of people use it, end quote, says Rao Zhang, a researcher at the King Kissinger Institute on China and the U.S. Quote, the Trump administration also tried to ban WeChat, which is not just a communication platform, but a technology platform that vacuums up reams of your data, more than TikTok. But WeChat is almost exclusively used in the U.S. by the Chinese diaspora, whereas TikTok is just broadly popular with Americans, end quote. She adds that while from a U.S. national security perspective, the existential threats are worth acknowledging. There wasn't enough information available about concrete concerns when the TikTok ban was on the table a couple of years ago or in remarks this summer. U.S. officials still don't seem, at least publicly, to have a smoking gun illustrating the urgency of the threat. Quote, it needed a better case built around it, and at the time in 2019, they just didn't seem to have that case, Zong said. Quote, whether they will have something to show Americans in the future or not, I cannot say, end quote. On June 24th, days after the BuzzFeed report, a group of Republican senators led by Tom Cotton of Arkansas sent a letter to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, quote, to inquire about the Biden administration's delayed response to the national security and privacy risks posed by TikTok, end quote which I, I found interesting. Why are you sending it to Janet Yellen? I don't understand why the the Treasury Secretary should be directly involved in this unless they're going to make a new economic policy about it and they're going to tell the Fed, no, you can't send any money. We have to mark all the bills that go to TikTok. I mean, it doesn't make much sense, but I guess their thought process is, hey, let's talk to somebody in the administration. All right. On June 28th, a different group of nine Republican senators sent a letter to TikTok CEO Zhao Xichu, laying out questions about the company's data management practices in relation with ByteDance, given that the company has always maintained that they do not share U.S. user data with the Chinese government. On July 5th, a bipartisan duo from the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Democrat Mark Warner of Virginia and Republican Marco Rubio of Florida sent a letter to the Federal Trade Commission urging the agency to investigate TikTok and ByteDance for, quote, repeated misrepresentations by TikTok concerning its data security, data processing, and corporate governance practices, end quote. In a series of responses this summer, both to lawmakers and the public, TikTok has staunchly maintained that it does not and would never share U.S. data with the Chinese government, and that it is a separate U.S.-based entity subject to U.S. laws. The company did not report publicly on the government data request, but it does publish a twice-annual report about government requests to remove content from the service. The latter report indicates that the company has never fulfilled a removal request from China. Yes, because they would definitely put that on the books when they release this information to the public in the United States. 
because that would definitely go over well for them. Back to the article. The bottom line, though, is that TikTok is owned by ByteDance, and some ByteDance employees can access TikTok or TikTok user data. Does that mean the ruling Chinese Communist Party can get the get data too? In his June 30 response to nine Republican senators, TikTok's Chu said, quote, employees outside the U.S., including Chinese-based employees, can have access to TikTok user data subject to a series of robust cybersecurity controls, authorizations, approval protocols overseen by our U.S.-based security team, end quote. He described at length the layers of classification and restriction that protect users from being accessed casually or without oversight. Chu and TikTok have long maintained that they, quote, have not provided U.S. user data to the CCP, nor would if they were asked, end quote, which I find highly unlikely. And even if they wouldn't, ByteDance still has access to it, so they could just ask ByteDance. So that's their nice little workaround there. Oh, we would, we would never, ever provide any information to the Chinese government. But wait, what about your overlord over there? What about the company that owns you? Well, I can't speak for them, that we we don't run them. That's a great little workaround there for TikTok. Still, it is unclear whether TikTok poses a unique and specific threat to the U.S. national security or if it is simply a convenient proxy through which lawmakers are grappling with larger issues of data security, privacy, misinformation, content moderation, and influence in a global tech market. Similarly, the U.S. Te- the Chinese telecom giant Huawei faced controversy over whether the U.S. should incorporate Chinese-made hardware into domestic 5G infrastructure, which was ultimately banned. Quote, there are definitely signs that the Chinese influence efforts are likely to grow, linked to the Chinese government's strategy more broadly of digital authoritarianism, end quote, says Kyan Venson a research analyst for the nonprofit digital rights think tank Freedom House. Quote, but it's important for us to acknowledge that the U.S. government has its own shadowy national security surveillance authorities, and in recent years, U.S. government agencies have monitored social media accounts of people contributing, uh, coordinating protests in the U.S., and done things like search electronic devices through the country and at the border. These sort of tactics undermine the idea that this is only a foreign threat, end quote. Yes, but remember here, uh, Ven Steenson, he's taking the approach that it's about data, personal data. When he should be taking the approach, it's about the power to influence the pop culture as well as politics, because politics is downstream of pop culture, period, full stop. The 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds today will be running the country in 20 years, 25 years, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how long the rhinos on both sides of the aisle decide to stay in. But the power to influence culture is extremely important, and that's the angle that they talked about briefly, but they didn't really dive into. And I think, remember, after this article, that's what you need to leave with. China has the ability even if it's indirectly through ByteDance, they have the ability to change the algorithms and possibly influence the future culture of America. This is scary stuff, or at least concerning, and needs to be addressed. So I think any measure right now, small steps are okay. Do I necessarily think that the U.S. government should be regulating this so heavily? No. In theory, no. But for national security, there could be a legitimate argument made there. Now, the fact that it's being done through presidential decree and executive order, I think is interesting. I think we need to pass more bipartisan legislation so it's seen as more valid by people rather than a president overreaching and using his executive power to ban something or create limitations just so we keep the power in the legislator rather than continually chipping away at it. Then there's the power imbalance TikTok may create. One thing about TikTok in particular is that its popularity and proliferation within the U.S. 
could make it one, a one-stop shop for Chinese governments to mine the data of U.S. users and launch influence operations in the U.S. Meanwhile, the U.S. government may feel that it lacks a comparable mechanism through which it can so directly pull Chinese user data and work to sway public opinion in China. Quote, let's assume for a second that the U.S. intelligence has access to WeChat, they would have to fight hard for that access, and it would constantly be at risk of discovery or neutralization. China, on the other hand, doesn't have to fight for access to TikTok. They have it by statutory authority, end quote, says Jake Williams, director of cyber threat intelligence at this security firm Scythe and former National Security Agency hacker. Quote, by itself, I don't think that the TikTok app on people's devices is a significant threat. But the potential for the Chinese data collection across the platform is a large concern, especially when combined with other already acquired data by Chinese state actors, end quote. Given its immense popularity, its ownership, and the fact that the bulk of TikTok's activities is public by nature, there is no clear technical solution to boxing China out of the service. The question is whether the U.S. government wants to devise a business solution or incentive development of an appealing alternative platform, since privacy violations, security concerns, and foreign influence operations against U.S. residents through social media are problems the U.S. government has yet to solve. And another technology ban or, or, nor counter-surveillance will make them go away. Quote, one thing that we really should escalate here is that the U.S. should be leading by example, end quote. Freedom House's Venstenson said, quote, when we talk about expanding the U.S. government's surveillance powers, that sets a really bad example for governments around the world, end quote. His perspective here, oh, we need to lead by example. Yes, I, I think that's a really cutesy idea. I don't think China really cares what example we're giving. They're going to do what they want to do. They have a long-term plan, and they're going to stick to it. But I think another alternative here, I think it's interesting that they're saying that we need to incentivize the development of another social media app that can do the same thing as TikTok, basically. How about we incentivize people, kids, adults, to not use social media as much? How about that? Why can't that be an option? Why can't we get away from these dopamine mechanisms that we have in our lives, such as social media. I'll tell you now, I don't have TikTok. And one of the main reasons was the security concerns that we heard about in 2019. And before that, it was just the hesitancy to do something new. I didn't know if it was flushed out enough. I thought, okay, another copy of Vine. And I saw how Vine went downhill. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get emotionally attached to something again. I'm not going to go home crying when it gets shut down like I did when Vine happened. So um, I just don't see the, the point in continuing to spend our lives scrolling through five-second TikToks. Now, some people see the value in that, and some people need it. And some people are really good. They go on for five minutes. But I know some kids that spend hours upon hours on it. So I think we possibly need to de-incentivize people from using the app to do better things. Read, go talk with people in real life, have interactions, maybe take a walk, something of that nature. But enough of my old man, oh, don't use TikTok rants. Let's go on to our last major article from 538. Why Massachusetts' governorship is the likeliest to flip in 2022. Massachusetts has an opening in its corner office. Republican Governor Charlie Baker is retiring. And in a state with no shortage of ambitious politicians, you'd expect there to be a central artery-worthy traffic jam to take his place. But instead, more than two months before the election day, it's already safe for Democratic Attorney General Mara Haley to start picking out new drapes. So, how did the race to the governor, the nation's 15th largest state, the birthplace of the American Revolution, the hub of New England, if not the universe, and if you can't already tell, my home state <laughs> is so uncompetitive. This author is funny and a little bit sarcastic. I like it. It wasn't always this way. 
a year ago, it looked like Bay Staters were in for not one, but two competitive gubernatorial primaries. Harvard professor Daniel Allen, state senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, and former state senator Ben Downing were all running on the Democratic side, while former Rep. G- Geoff Delhi was challenging Baker in the Republican primary. Normally, a primary challenge on a sitting governor would be a fool's errand, but Baker is not the favorite of the GOP base. Part of the long-running tradition of moderate, even liberal Republican governors in the Northeast, Baker has worked with the Democratic legislator to fight climate change, protect abortion rights, and he even came out in favor of impeaching former President Donald Trump for his role in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Baker's approval rating among Republicans, in other words, wasn't great. It was only 35% in November 2021, according to a COVID states project poll. And after Trump endorsed Dolly, a public policy polling survey (laughs) sponsored by the Democratic Governors Association, admittedly (laughs) not a disinterested party, found... Delhi beating Baker in the GOP primary by 21 percentage points. Baker denied the fear of losing the primary had anything to do with it, but he pulled the plug in December 2021, and his decision to not run for re-election changed the trajectory of the race for both parties. On the very day of Baker's retirement, speculation turned to whether Haley, a rising Democratic star, would launch a campaign. With Haley's candidacy and a $3.3 million war chest looming, Downing dropped out of the race a few weeks later. Haley officially threw her hat into the ring in January, and she immediately crowded out the remaining candidates. A January poll of the Democratic primary from Mass Inc. polling group gave her 48% to Chang Diaz's 12 and Allen's 3%. Less than a month later, Allen was out of the race, too. Chang Diaz hung in there a little longer, but still facing a 33-point deficit in a June poll from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She announced on June 23rd that she had, quote, no path to win the primary and was dropping out as well. Although Chang Diaz's name is still appearing on ballots, Haley is essentially unopposed in Tuesday's Democratic primary, and it doesn't look like she'll have much trouble in the general election either. Poll after poll has given Haley a commanding lead. Most recently, Suffolk University in July had Haley at 54% and Dolly at 23%. Yeah, he's going to get whacked across the face. And according to all three versions of the 538 midterm forecast, Haley has a greater than 99 in 100 chance of beating Dolly. That makes Massachusetts the most likely governorship to change parties in the 2022 election, just behind Maryland, another blue state where a moderate Republican governor is retiring and Republicans have nominated a diehard Trump supporter to replace him. It's true that Massachusetts has elected only one Democratic governor since 1990, and it's true that Baker is currently one of the most popular governors in the country. But as partisanship comes to hold greater and greater sway over gubernatorial elections, Massachusetts may be simply too Democratic, according to the 538 partisan lean. It's the most blue state in the country to elect another Republican governor, especially one as Trumpy as Dolly. Granted, Dolly still has to win his own primary on Tuesday, and some Republicans believe they could still win in November if they nominate self-described, quote, pragmatic businessman Chris Dowdy. But Dowdy's belief that Trump lost the 2020 election and promised to keep abortion legal in Massachusetts is unlikely to fly in Republican primaries. An August poll from Advantage slash Fiscal Alliance Foundation gave Dolly a 42% to 27% lead, and even if Dowdy were to upset Dolly, in, <laughs> wow, that's a way to start a sentence, in the primary, polls currently suggest he would just do as poorly as Dolly in the general election. In other words, Haley is in good shape. Not only to flip the Massachusetts governor's office from red to blue, but also to make history. She would be the first woman elected governor of Massachusetts and the first openly lesbian governor of any state. 
So no matter what happens in the midterms elsewhere in the country, Massachusetts will give Democrats at least one thing to celebrate. I, I, I don't really see anything special there. Uh, I think you need to be careful about October, November, September, August, just surprises in general. Something always comes up. There's always some sort of political slaughter campaign. So I don't know if it's 100% locked in, but from the information we're getting from 538, she's probably going to win. So we'll have a historic uh, new governor in Massachusetts here in the next few months. All right. The last story of the day is our daily delight from Newsweek. Dog sitting on owner's lap during flight melts hearts coming home. A dog named Enzo has gone viral on social media after his owner shared a video of him enjoying his flight home after the end of their vacation. In a video shared on TikTok, I think it's funny that this was shared on TikTok when I was just railing against them a few minutes ago. Um, In August, by the dog's owner... Under the username Enzo's Escapades, the Italian Greyhound can be seen enjoying his flight on his owner's lap, looking relaxed at his, uh, as his pet owner looks at him. The video, which so far has been viewed more than 390,000 times and liked over 47,000 times, comes with a caption that reads, quote, Vacation is over. We are coming home. According to Dog Time, Italian Greyhounds are quite easygoing dogs and very affectionate with their owners, family, children, and strangers. Italian Greyhounds don't shed much and are quite easy to groom. They're fairly easy to train and quite intelligent creatures. Their energy levels are very high, and so their potential for playfulness is also. They are medium-sized companion dogs with a height of... Yeah, we don't need the whole details... And they also have a list here of the airlines that uh, allow you to have your dogs. I think some of the comments, though, are a little bit cuter, so we'll go to those. Most users love the dog and how chilly it was during the flight. Noella said, Lovely. Dogs aren't allowed to fly in the cabin to and from UK, so I don't travel much anymore, as I refuse to fly mine as cargo. They're family, not luggage. Another wrote, oh my God, stunning. And another called him absolutely adorable. Etihad, which is the company the dog was using to fly back home, also got involved in commenting, saying, quote, this moment couldn't be more perfect. (laughs) Of course, the corporate Twitter account would be extremely cringy. All right, well... Thanks for joining me for the sixth episode of the Daily Flip podcast. If you want to read any of these articles or the data that I mentioned about the election confidence, it will be linked in the description below, below that like and subscribe button. All right. Only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.